Thank you. I'm going to give you a talk today that I've been looking forward to hearing for the last 49 years. I, I'm giving it instead of hearing it because the man who did most of the work is sitting over there insisting that I give it. But uh, most of, and, and I'm going to give you background for about half an hour, so although I waited 49 years, you have to wait half another half hour, and then I'll tell you why I'm excited about doing it. Most of the original work that I'm going to describe was done by Noah, and in conjunction with his brother Matthew, and they worked with their brothers and sisters, and I had the fun of watching all of this go on. In 1968, Linus Pauling and I uh, were working on nutrition. And we had, we worked, we tried various things. We believed that he suggested, and I agreed, that there was wide variation in nutrition requirements between different people and in different circumstances. But we had a problem. We wanted to make graphs of this sort, health versus the amount of something you eat. For example, if it's vitamin C, there's no health without vitamin C because you die without it, it's a vitamin. And as you get more of it, your health will improve until you reach it to an optimum, and then you're eating too much and your health starts to go down again. If you could determine those optimal amounts for each person in each circumstance that they, of their life that you want to optimize, that would be good. And even if you could get a general idea, you could get a distribution function of where those optima lie so that you could make reasonable op uh, recommendations to people in general. And although we worked on this subject for quite a long time, we did not have any way of measuring health quantitatively. So we hit upon an approach that we would take, which is different from that that is normally taken in clinical medicine. We looked at a human being and we said, and if you, you know, doctors work on these things all the time, medical people, they, they used to study just cholesterol, now they study a few things that are connected with the cholesterol. There are several hundred tests in the clinical laboratories in the hospital that you can uh, take if your doctor suggests them. And of course, if you go in for an ordinary exam, they measure about 30 things. The things that medicine measures in, in the people that are lined up outside the door and they aren't lined up there until they're suffering and, and in, in difficulty are things that have been selected over the years as things that they believe have a lot of information about something a lot of information about some particular disease or health condition and so on. And this is averaged in with their other observational things. Uh, but it's very expensive. If you're interested in preventive medicine, uh, you want something that's cheap, easy. It's sort of populist medicine. You don't want to just help people who are already suffering so much that they're willing to spend a lot of money or have someone else spend a lot of money to try to get them well. You would like to be able to do things proactively to help them. But if you do that, it has to be inexpensive. And if you choose the substances because you think they're very important, then the assays turn out to be expensive because you are not, don't have no choice. But we felt that it was likely, since there are so many thousands of substances in human metabolism, that we might get a good quantitative measurement of health by just measuring as many as we could, selecting them because they were easy and cheap to measure. And we felt that this technique might be able to measure everything that we in, were interested in about a person. You understand if you measured 100 things, even if you just classified them as high or low, there's two to the 100th patterns. And we believe that the metabolism of an individual as a function of his health, as a function of some disease he may be getting and so forth, uh, would reflect unique patterns that were, con that were related to his health. Now, this is a little cartoon I grew, drew in one of our early papers. You see, we gave the guy, we were interested in urine, breath, tissues. Urine was easy to work on, so we did most of it on urine. As a little guy, as analyzer, I put Linus up on the, on the, on the ladder with uh, vitamin C in his pocket and the sugar in the wastebasket. And the idea was to try to use the analysis to optimize health. We worked on this for 10 years. Uh, it took us about five years to build the analytical laboratory to do it. It was, became, it was the most fi finest analytical laboratory for urine in the world. And this particular apparatus measured the vapor over urine. It smelled urine. Uh, did it quantitatively. It, uh, it was a very sophisticated device, totally computerized with PDP-11 computers of that era. And this is what it 
what a urine profile from this looked like. It was able to do four of these every six hours. It was very slow, fundamentally expensive, but we could get 150 parameters out of this. The other chromatography method, we only used chromatography initially. The only other chromatography method we used was the amino acid analyzers, which are ubiquitous in protein chemistry. You can get about a 15 anhydrin positive compounds. So we set out to measure these substances and look for patterns related to different things about human beings. Uh, here's an early experiment uh, determining, seeing if we can tell which sex Sanford students are. Now, there's a better way, but we were looking to see whether there was a pattern. There, and I'll explain this, because you'll see several of these diagrams. Here we were measuring about 60 things, urinary amines, and uh, we would just take each one. We'd have a group. We, in this case, we have the men, the women, and we do non-parametric statistical analysis of the probability that there's a correlation that separates the two. You have to do all the statistics non-parametrically because you can't prove any of these things are Gaussian. Uh, so the, it's the inverse. It's if, if, if there is no pattern, then the dots follow the straight line. In other words, uh, you'd find that uh, if you had 65 things, six and a half would be expected at p equals 0.1, 13 at p equals 0.2, and so forth, because it was random and you get a straight line. If you have an accumulation of low probabilities, indicating a, a, propon a, a greater number of correlating substances than you expect by chance, then that causes the line to rise in the early part, and it deviates above. So here you can see that we have about 20 substances out of 60 uh, that are strongly correlating, and about 30, approximately half of them correlate with sex even though none of these things, amino acids and things of that sort, or have any, there's no literature on these correlating with sex. They're just things that were easy to measure. If we try to separate G, uh, Prince Stanford students by GPA, it fails, and you can see what happens if there's no pattern. The line, the things fall along a line. Deviates a little bit because of the small number of subjects. Uh, there's a lot of computer work connected with this. In those days, your lab automation all had to be in machine language. Even doing the brain calculations were difficult. And uh, so I was fortunate to uh, find a colleague who would uh, do all our calculations, a tremendous system programmer. Uh, she signed a rather, demanded a rather serious long-term contract. But when we were, after we were married, we worked together. Uh, and Laura Lee did all of our calculations. Uh, this uh, shows you the, and it's, there's quite a lot of calculation in this sort of pattern recognition. This shows the sophistication of the computers we use. These were two PD11, PDP-11 computers. It's literally running in our little computer center. This thing here is a disk drive. We were the first laboratory at Stanford University to get a hard disk drive. You got the drive. It cost us $20,000 in 1975 money, and uh, you had to write your own drivers. But it was wonderful. It had a removable disk, and it had a capacity of one megabyte. <laughs> and uh, it was wonderful when we got it, because prior to that, all the stories was on tape. Uh, to describe what we were trying to do in perhaps a little different and more understandable way, this is the survival curve of human beings, men, in the United States. And you see, most of them don't live for their intrinsic lifespan. They're all of these early deaths. What you would like to achieve is this, where people live most of their intrinsic lifespan. First they live, and secondly, they're in good health, and then they die over a relatively short time related to the intrinsic lifespan. And this is not impossible. If you do experiments on flies in the laboratory, you have that curve. I'll show you one in a minute. If you do experiments on mice, you get something pretty close to the blue curve. But people, this is what we have. It is unacceptable that this is the case. It is unacceptable that people, especially in our nation, should die at the age of 40 in large quantities and should have a curve like this where only a small number of them actually achieve the full life that they've been blessed to have. This, if you were studying uh, intrinsic aging, while well, you'd be trying to push the curve out, that isn't what we were studying. Although it is known that by 
nutritional deprivation, you could extend the life of most animals by about 25%. So that may even be within reach, but that wasn't our goal. To, so we would do these, find these patterns, measure them quantitatively, and look for patterns related to disease and to, with respect to things that people would need to know. So suppose that you could put, I'll show you some aging curves, suppose you could determine where the individual is on this axis, on the aging axis, if you could determine statistically how much of his life remained. That would be this blue one with a little x. And suppose that pattern is a good one, so you can watch yourself move down that line. If you could, then when you read in some health food magazine that if you eat something special, you'll live longer, or if you read that if you exercise more, you'll live longer, you could watch this X move and see whether you could slow it down. And you could do experiments also. If you had 100 men, you could take 100 men, watch, the cur watch them move along that line. The average would give you very precise, great precision. And then perhaps in a year, you could do an aging curve, aging experiment on something that might be useful. The way it is now, you have to wait for people to die. So if I got very interested in some nutrient and I got a whole bunch of money and got a lot of people to eat it or not eat it and so forth, we might do one aging experiment and Noah could do the second one and his son could do the next one and it'd take a long time to find out. But if you have an aging pattern, you could do things even on individuals. Uh, if you, as far as illness is concerned, could you see the profile of a degenerative disease before the person knows he has it? If you can see that, and degenerative diseases, you know, gradually come on, they don't suddenly come on. And if you could see, place the person on an axis, the probability of becoming ill, depending on whether how close his pattern was to the sick end or the well end, then you could fight the probability of disease rather than the disease itself. That would be an advantage. If he's already sick, you could at least monitor therapy. You know, if someone gets cancer, the doctor says, oh, you have cancer, I suggest you do this. But you know, there are not 10, probably 10 different things you can do. Well, it would be nice to be able to watch yourself, and if it's not working out, try something else. That doesn't happen in modern medicine because if the doctor were, say, to test, your, test you every week for cancer to see how it's going, he would be prosecuted for over, you know, over testing. But it'd be nice if you could do it yourself but only if you could do it inexpensively. Only if you could do it, I made a rule that our goal was that any analysis that we finally produced would cost $5. So anyone could, any person could perhaps follow himself in this way or anything else about the quality of life. Suppose you're a long distance runner and there's a pattern <laughs> related to which runners run the fastest and which ones don't. Then you could watch uh, that. That would be something about the quality of life, a long distance runner. And this has reality. I had a friend who was a, a miler. He's about my age, but when he was a young man, he was a miler in the age when they were breaking the four minute mile. But he never broke it. He came very close. He was ranked in the world, but he never broke it. In those days, they told him to eat lots of protein. They know now that a runner should eat lots of carbohydrate. He could have broken the four minute mile. And there are all kinds of subtleties to that. But if he could have watched some aspect of the quality of his life quantitatively, this might be possible. So this is basically the goal. The goal is to square that curve so that it is not the case that people die before they have the full life that they have been blessed with, and uh, to do so by locating them here by finding patterns. Here's an experiment on, um, on fly aging. You see, that's an aging curve for flies in the laboratory. Surely we could do that well but we don't. Uh, we know a lot about how to take care of the flies. If you study mice in the laboratory, you get the same thing, flat for a long time, and then it falls off. Here's the pattern for flies. Now this, we couldn't collect urine from the little fruit flies, so we ground up the whole fruit fly and digested it with a proteolytic enzyme, but there's the pattern for aging in fruit flies. Now this is studied from things that, oh, every, every substance that was accumulating here accumulated and these were easy and cheap to do. There was not a single paper in the literature relating any of those substances to aging. We had just chosen the substances because we had a machine that would measure those easily. And there's a very strong pattern, and you can use it. Here are little groups of fruit flies 
And this is the order of their diagnostic coefficient for aging, one, two, three, four, five, six. The, the diagnostic coefficient, the degree to which their pattern matches the young and the old, uh, can be plotted, and it, it tells you what, how old they are, which is progress. Uh, here's mice, young mice versus old mice. And you see accumulation of substances here. This is on the vapor. This is the smell of the urine over the mouth. The mouse is urine, except highly sophisticated measurement. You measured about 170 things. And you can see here that about 40, 45 of them are age correlated. We also did this with men. It comes out the same way. Uh, if you suppose you want to diagnose, you want to know whether the mouse is young or old, you've taken his position on that axis I showed you and you put each one on the axis. Now, of course, if all the young ones were over here and all the old ones were way over here, you'd have perfect separation. That isn't often the case. Oftentimes, things aren't perfect. This is the kind of graph we invented for evaluating these things. If you take all of those the aging, the, the mice in that curve I just showed you, and you calculate uh, a number, which we call, I'm not going to go into the number and stuff. It won't be important. But you calculate a number, which we call a diagnostic coefficient for aging, and you place every mouse on that curve, on that line. So most decisions you make are linear. So you take 500 parameters or 100 parameters, you squash them to linearity and pattern recognition. Then uh, you can ask, well, uh, if I want to be right about all of the young mice, how many errors will I make with respect to the old mice? You see, this one is almost perfect. The straight line is what you get if there's no, no ability to diagnose, and perfection is a point in the origin. In this case, it's almost perfect. Uh, then we looked at diseases. This is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis by urinary means. No, nothing in the literature is saying these urinary means correlate with multiple sclerosis. But there are men with multiple sclerosis, women with multiple sclerosis, and there's an accumulation of low probability, some accumulation of things which are correlating with MS. Uh, we did, this is a summary of what we did in those years. It took about 10 years. Uh, we have patterns for multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, Huntington's disease, breast cancer, aging of fruit flies, mice and men, sex, diurnal variation, biochemical individuality at birth, biochemical individuality as adults, so good that if you controlled the diet, you, it's like fingerprints. You can fingerprint everybody. If you, if you are going to you know, rob a bank, uh, don't go on a synthetic diet for a week and then leave a urine at the, at, the, at the crime scene. We'll get you. But biochemical individuality, fasting diet, and then we uh, gradually, at that time, uh, invented at the Stanford Research Institute, they had just invented mass spectrometers that didn't break the molecules when they were put in. And so we were the first to use molecular ion mass spectrometry uh, to do this sort of thing too. We just got started, it's in a long story, but now it fits in with the rest of the story I will tell. Uh, so we discovered these patterns, but there were several weaknesses in what we did. The first weakness with respect to disease was that all the people were sick. We took sick people and well people. But sick people live different sorts of lives than well people, and we may not be studying the disease. We might be studying the life they lived, including the drugs they took and whatever else was happening because they were ill. Secondly, our methods were too expensive. We built the finest analytical lab in the world, but there was only one, and we could only measure uh, samples at a certain rate. In that 10-year period, we measured about 15,000 samples that we got from physicians and others who, who had uh, interesting things. And the third thing that was missing, because it was slow and expensive to do these things, were serial samples on individuals. If you have, today, if you go to the doctor's office and give them a blood sample, and they give them back a number for the range and where you are in the range on that substance. They don't even do a pattern recognition on the 30 substances, which they should do. But you're compared to the whole population. Compared to yourself, it's a much more greater precision tool. So really, a person should serve as his own control. 
Once we had the DDP meeting at the Palo Verde Nuclear Power Station, and Ed York was standing beside me. He's a, he was a wonderful engineer. And Ed looked at the bearings on the turbines. Each of those turbines was producing twice the power of Hoover Dam. And big shafts and turbines. He says, you know, they don't wait for those, tur those, those bearings to squeak. What they do is they put a little hole near the bearing in the casing and put in a vibration sensor. It studies all the vibrations and learns the personality of the bearing. Then when the personality changes, the engineers get busy. Well, if you have serial samples on people, then you get rid of all the biochemical individuality and the power will become much more powerful. We didn't have that. We were mostly single samples, people who were sick, and uh, slow, expensive, expensive devices. But we had proved the hypothesis. We had done so many different patterns that the hypothesis we made that the information was there was proven. But we weren't able to do it in a way that was practical. Now we would have continued to work. This happened between 1968 and 1978. We would have continued to work on this. You know, we started at UCSD and then at Stanford, and then Linus and I founded a research institute, and that thrived for about five years, and then we got into an argument. And the argument had to do with other research. Uh, we were talking a lot about, he was talking a lot about cancer and nutrition and so forth, and I thought we should do some experiments on this. So I got, uh, and I put up a nice mouse facility for about a thousand mice and got a couple technicians and started doing dose response curves of growth rate of cancer as a function of diet. And in this particular experimental system, you have mice which are bred with one flaw, their hair falls out. And then you, you can irradiate them with UV light and gradually give them squamous cell carcinoma, which is about the same pathologically as that that is given to humans. So we give these mice squamous cell carcinoma and we watched the growth rate of the carcinoma, which was on their skin, so it was easy to observe. We did 40 experiments on this and various things, and we found all 40 experiments could ex be explained in one way. The better nutrition, the faster the cancer grew. Which makes sense, it wasn't what we expected, you know, you think bad nutrition, that cancer's bad, nutrition's bad, bad nutrition, no, it wasn't that way. Here's an example, this is the amount of protein in the diet of the mice. It starts at 5% protein and goes out to about 60%. Uh, if you have too little protein, the cancer grows. At the, and the, this is the, uh, a measure of the, it won't go into the exact way it's determined, but a measure of the growth rate of the cancer. And as you can see, it's fairly low. As they get more and more protein, it reaches a maximum. Then they're getting too much protein and goes back down. And at that time, if you bought Purina mouse chow from, from uh, the commercial supplier for laboratory mice to keep them in the best of health, you bought 17% protein. That's exactly where that top point is. And uh, so this is the optimum diet for mice for their health as far as the experimentalists were concerned. If they had less, the cancer went down. That's about a threefold difference. In the entire experimental set, we found that we could increase cancer rates by twofold or decrease them by tenfold by diet alone. And all the dietary variations that decrease them were uh, uh, poor nutrition. But I did one too many experiments. This is the experiment on vitamin C. It was reproduced, what happens, and the curve on the bottom, you have to relate the amount of uh, vitamin C you're giving the mouse to a human, but it relates in such a way that that's about the amount you take per day. And as you know, Frederick Klenner started and was followed by many people that you should take a gram or two. When I was growing up, my mother's given me a gram or two of vitamin C a day because Adele Davis said it was a good thing to do. And uh, so there was a, a culture of taking one, two, three grams of vitamin C a day. Linus thought a lot of that. He analyzed the, vert, the data on vitamin C in the common cold, and there is a benefit to the common cold, or to, to suppressing colds. But he was... Uh, telling people that vitamin C would suppress cancer as well. And of course, what happened was uh, two or three grams a day is in fact <laughs> good nutrition, and it doubled the cancer growth rate. As you go down, as you give more and more, and you get into this region, the mice are in poorer health, but they're still alive, and the cancer is growing much more slowly. Or if you feed them raw fruits and vegetables, it grows slowly, because that's a good way to starve yourself, eat raw fruits and vegetables and nothing else. 
Uh, but this was a politically incorrect experiment because my colleague <laughs> didn't like the top of the curve. We got in quite a fight. It wasn't, I think the fight would have been resolved except there were some other unprincipled people that liked to see us fighting and we stopped working together. And when we did, the profiling lab collapsed because we couldn't finance it or continue it. Uh, Laura Lee and I thought about going back into academia and decided we'd rather raise our family on a farm in Oregon, so we moved to Oregon and with colleagues helped set up what is now the Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine. This is a picture of us uh, in uh, uh, 1988. Uh, I noticed, uh, I didn't, I was pretty clueless as a young man, and uh, I remember not thinking it was a little odd. We started looking for our first house, which was near the lab. I just uh, talked, we did that work in, and she kept looking at these big houses. And uh, I didn't really understand that, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, she did. And uh, so although she died in 1988, uh, and I lost my colleague, because she worked right beside me for every eight, 10 hours a day and raised a family. Will, and we were doing civil defense work in those days. You may remember this. Uh, if you went to DDP meetings in those days, you saw these things we built for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And, and uh, we built the first one about the time just before she died. And the children and I would travel around the country and, and uh, deliver these to the states that asked for them. And FEMA would, would pay our costs in building them. And we worked pretty hard on civil defense. We got about 8,000 people in a nationwide organization. And of course, this is Doctors for Disaster Preparedness. We started working on it. I met Jane Orient because she was active in civil defense. Anyway, this is, this is a shelter we were delivering to uh, the emergency, management, uh, emergency uh, training center in Maryland. Uh, and this was my staff. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, the, uh, you learn very fast who the most important person in the house is when you start taking care of the, the staff. You see Matthew, I'm carrying Matthew. He, uh, he now is the man in charge of our urine sample bank project. Uh, Matthew is the only PhD in nuclear engineering who has had his diaper changed in a bomb shelter in gas stations all over the United States. <laughs> There's Noah, Zachary, Aaron, Joshua, and Bethany. So, and we're giving Steve, Sims, <laughs> giving Steve Sims, the senator from Idaho, a copy of Nuclear War Survival Skill. The staff got bigger. Uh, we were homeschooling. And uh, at this age was when they about start, started to create their own curriculum project. Curriculum. What happened was, uh, Laura Lee was homeschooling them in the usual way, which is the mother is the teacher. She worked very hard at that, did an excellent job. Uh, but I couldn't do what I had to do and be a teacher. So we had a schoolroom and had desks for everybody. And Daddy had his desk in the room, too. That kept it sort of quiet. But gradually, I just stopped giving them instructions. And gradually, they became a self-teaching homeschool. And gradually, we developed rules that I wouldn't help them. No one would help them. So they had to get up in the morning, do their math, and... Uh, they didn't get them all right. When they checked their answers, they had to work till they got them right. Now, Matthew says, I don't tell the truth about this. He says, I did help him. He says, I helped him about once every two years. <laughs> but uh, that was our homeschool. And uh, it, the homeschooling method, which we worked out, uh, worked well with them. And some homeschoolers got interested in it. And Mary Pride uh, at Factorical Homeschooling encouraged us. And about this time, is when they were scanning all of their books and procedures onto CDs and starting to sell a homeschool curriculum. And today they have about 60,000 students. They got quite a few students in a hurry. And, uh, and, and it's a little family business selling these things. $195, you get a 12 years of education in a box, and you print your own books from the CDs. I remember uh, standing here giving a talk to DDP many, many years ago, and a family came in the back. And I stopped my talk. I said, turn around. Everybody look at that. That's a homeschool family. I didn't know them. I said, it's a homeschool family. It's the hope of the nation. And a lot of the hope of the nation rests with the homeschoolers. How many homeschool students do we have today? I saw two. Student. Students. You're two. Yeah, there was a student. Right. And uh, uh, if you look at these people, if you've looked at as many students as I have, you know they're homeschooled. I can meet them on the street. It's different. They're taught uh, much the way our public schools were able to teach 50 years ago, but 
Uh, it's, a, it's a fine thing. Anyway, they were starting their curriculum then. Uh, we had worked on two things. When I was a student, uh, a graduate student, I got out and got a job on the faculty there. I, uh, I, thought, I, I, was, I thought, this is fantastic. I'm going to have fun all my life, and people are going to pay me for it, because I just loved the laboratory. It was just fun. And then I had a little better thoughts, and I thought, well, maybe you should spend half your time having fun and half your time doing things that might be helpful to the people who are paying for your fun. So I, that was why uh, uh, I was in, I, interested in working with Pauling on the nutrition. But our fun was molecular clocks, little, uh, little uh, clocks that we discovered, chemical clocks that are built into protein molecules. And during those years, my students and I and so forth worked away at clocks. And we, we got uh, gradually what is called in science mounting evidence for the hypothesis that the clocks existed. But we didn't have definitive knowledge that they existed and exactly how they worked. Well, the staff grew larger. Noah went to Caltech and his PhD project in three years, he proved the clocks worked and uh, made, a, made a, a wonderful thing. He eventually got to the point where he, if you gave him the three-dimensional structure of a protein, he could tell you how fast all the clocks in it were running. And we wrote a book about it, and that worked out very well. We also used a mass spectrometer for the work, but it was a very simple one, measuring uh, uh, single mass units. This work went very well, and we then, then a new kind of mass spectrometer that kept advancing all the time, and a mass spectrometer that could do a tremendous amount uh, came out. And, when you're studying, we were studying these little changes in small molecules and watching the rates of deamidation, the rates of the clock run. But if you want to watch the clocks directly in a whole protein, you may have a molecular weight of 10 or 20,000, and the change in the, as the clock runs is about a tenth of a mass unit or two tenths. So you need a very powerful mass spectrometer. And we, uh, we were very fortunate. We, we don't take any government money. We haven't for 40 years. but we, we uh, we're fortunate, we told all our supporters, some of you, I'm sure, helped to buy our mass spectrometer. And uh, this thing has a, a 75 gallons of liquid helium in it and a, a superconducting magnet, a couple of mass spectrometers that feed it, the, the molecules that particularly you want to measure. And we did a lot of work with this. We did some useful things. This is the work that Noah and Matthew did with men at Caltech to uh, study the, the clocks that run in the, in the protein that precipitates in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. We don't study Alzheimer's patients. We weren't trying to cure the disease. We were protein chemists, and we wanted the people who worked on this protein and did work on the disease to know how fast their protein was changing and how. And, and that was done in that machine. We also realized once we had this machine in captivity, and it, it was a miracle we got it because it cost a million and a half dollars, but people were generous, they donated money, and not just one person, some, a lot of people. And we now had in our hands something that could very quickly look at a urine sample. So we went back to studying the profiling work to see if now the technology was possible. We would proved the hypothesis in the old days, but we hadn't given people something that would work. So uh, we started with aging, because aging, about 30% of the substances in your urine correlate with physiological age, uh, and there are thousands of things in your urine, so you can pick any set you want. But we started measuring those. Noah and Matthew did an experiment. But the, the machine uh, has tremendous resolution, extremely high resolution. It can see uh, very small mass differences, but it has a quirk, and the quirk is that the cell in which the mass separations are made and the masses of the molecules are, are determined, only holds a, a million molecules in one shot. So if you do 200 experiments and average them, you still only have 200 molecules. And if the amounts vary over three orders of magnitude, you're beginning to look at things where you only have 500 molecules. Now, you may have to be a chemist or a physicist or something to understand how little that is, <laughs> but it's a very, very small amount. And the only way this machine in, in our, that we had could do this was by attaching a chromatograph to it, which would separate the molecules so that the things that were coming were in, it, small numbers of them came at once. You put it in the machine over a period of time, small, and the chromatograph sort of gradually separates groups, and small numbers get into the machine at a time, 
And then you can crank it up, and if you're only measuring, say, 50 things at once, then you can take 200 million divided by 50. You have peaks big enough to, to see and use. It had another problem, however. This machine didn't, wasn't ever made for this. They were used mostly in qualitative work, and it, it couldn't do the work quantitatively. Now, Noah did an experiment. He and Matthew did an experiment. They saw the pattern for aging, just as before. We could see the technology was working. The machine lacked capabilities to make it a routine thing, put it in, get an analysis, rely on the analysis. And it also lacked the ability to see all of the things you can see in urine uh, unless you did this very slow process ahead of time, which would have made it very costly. Uh, so I, I just illustrated that. You see if you have a million molecules. That, and uh, there is a method for introducing the samples, but those methods uh, uh, also, when, you have, when you're me measuring a couple hundred molecules, 500 molecules, it becomes a different world. If you put your sample through a very tiny piece of tubing, the tubing makes a grab for the molecules and starts adding molecules from the things that went through it before. This contaminates things. Uh, if there's salt in it, this affects the mass spectrometry, but if you put it through a little device that will take the salt out, the little device adds things to the sample and subtracts things from the sample. And basically, the techniques that could be done with this machine were not capable of seeing this wonderful urinary profile, and no one had ever done it because we have a unique requirement. For a century, biochemists have been working, and now the work is accelerated because of wonderful machines like this. Uh, they've been working to understand human biochemistry. And if you listen to some of them, they, they think they understand it. Uh, maybe they understand 1% now, and, and perhaps in a couple centuries, uh, someone on the Starship Enterprise will push a button and the metabolism of a human will be understood and they can do medicine this way, but today it's just an ongoing beautiful work, but it isn't uh, understood. We're not asking to understand. You see, what we were doing was conceptually different. We were saying, sometime you'll understand human biochemistry. Sometime you'll understand human diseases. You'll understand them well enough that you can make a reasoned approach. You see something that affects one metabolite, affects another, you understand it all, and then you can figure this out rationally. But we aren't there. And it is unacceptable that people are dying early now. So we said, we'll measure the things that we can get that are easy to measure and look for statistical patterns in them that are strong enough to manipulate the health of people to their advantage today. It's entirely different than doing things you understand. And as I indicated in that sex pattern, for example, you can tell the sex of a Stanford student, but using substances that there are no papers in the literature at all saying those substances have the slightest thing to do with sex. And, and the same way with these diseases. So our machine, uh, uh, but, but we, no, no one knew how to improve our machine, but the company that makes these machines wouldn't sell them the parts. They wanted to sell us an upgrade for our machine and that was $600,000, which was impossible. But after a year, he talked them into letting us run them on their machine. So we started commuting to Massachusetts, which is what we do today, to measure our substances. And Noah worked out a procedure. This was really remarkable. I've seen him do some amazing things in the laboratory, but this is really remarkable. He had three weeks, and he had a couple hundred samples we wanted to run, and had never used that machine or its special capabilities before. He spent about half of the three weeks figuring out a protocol that worked. And what happened was, after we got the contamination down and used the source that their machine has that, uh, that doesn't involve tubes to introduce it, and, and he just gradually discarded all the procedures that added contamination and made it impossible to see the urine patterns. And as, when he got them done, he was doing analytical work of a kind that had never been done on that machine before, but the urinary patterns just rose out of the mist and were sitting there looking at them. And what rose out of the mist are 200,000 different, different molecules, of which about 30,000 were measured well enough to be quantitative. And uh, uh, those uh, substances moved through the mass spectrometer in different chemical forms. But when he put all the forms together, he had 4,000 constituents and or over 800 that are known to be part of human metabolism and could do this reproducibly over and over and over. This, uh, for those of you who are chemists or 
remember your chemistry or have ever used a mass spectrometer, you know what I mean. Carbon is defined as 12. And uh, then there's carbon-13, which has one more neutron. Or nitrogen is 14, and so on. But the only atom which has a, really has a unit mass is carbon, because it's defined, C12 is defined as 12.0000. And because the nuclear binding energies are different for each atomic nucleus, all the other atoms do not have unit masses. So C14 does not have a mass of exactly 14 because it has two extra neutrons that change the nucleus around, the binding energy is different than it is in C12. So all of the atomic species in the periodic table, except for C12, have slightly different masses. You can't see them with a normal mass spectrometer, but you can with this. And this uh, is, I've turned, we've turned the sensitivity up so you can see it more. Those are peaks going up and down. This is one mass unit. This is mass 261. And the spectrum runs from 260.7 to 261.3. A normal mass spectrometer would have one peak. This has 240. That illustrates the resolution of the device. And since we were looking over a mass range of about 1,000, there are almost 1,000 of these outputted from that mass spectrometer, or a couple hundred thousand substances are measured. It took us, he had a cycle time of seven minutes in Massachusetts, but you could get it down to two minutes if you wanted. This is a research project and there were interruptions and so forth. So in two minutes, you can measure uh, a tremendous amount. And if you think about the patterns you might be able to see, well, we had already proved there were unique patterns of the things I listed, but think about this. Even if you take 800 metabolites and we, if you go down here we decided to do our calculations on 800 that we knew were produced inside human beings. We could have used more because there were a lot of things correlating that weren't produced in human beings. Um, that if you just classify, you didn't even measure them quantitatively, we just classed them as above or below average. The number of patterns is two to the 800th, right? There's <laughs> plenty of patterns to describe everything. The uh, uh, this shows you a little more about it. This is the mass spectrometer at various sensitivities. You can see at the lower sensitivity, but actually he's just, he's just plotting it this way. They have all the data. To, and you see if you have a lower sensitivity and keep turning it up, you get more and more and you get what I described. One of the things he had to do was to deal with salt in the urine. And the standard thing in uh, using this kind of machine is to run your sample through a desalting column because you see the substances are ionized. What travels through the mass spectrometer are ions. And then they're separated by their charge to mass ratio. So they're ionized, and in this case, they're ionized by a laser. You, you take the sample, you put it on a little plate, it goes into the vacuum and sits there, and the laser hits it 500 times, bum, 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 creates a cloud of ions, and the ions are sucked into a tube, and they go down into the analyzing chamber. Uh, but uh, salt ions are a complication because they're very ionic. You've got a lot of sodium chloride and potassium in your sodium, potassium, magnesium in your urine. And that uh, those ions attach themselves to the other molecules when they're flying through the vacuum. But the salt desalting the samples contaminated them so much we couldn't, wouldn't be able to see the pattern. So he just did it without salt. And the result is that he had to measure a lot of things. There's the amino acid glutamine. That one's got two potassiums on it. That one's got three potassiums on it. That one's got a sodium and potassium. That one's got two sodiums. That one's got three sodiums. So glutamine is appearing in several different places, different, different forms. Plus there are the isotopes, because if it had a little C13 in it, that one would be off by a mass. So on average, there were about eight different quantitatable forms for each of the substances we were looking at. So we had to write computer programs that would go through these 200,000, find them, co collect them in the right groups, and determine the quantitation, and, and did. The reason that we were able to do this, and the reason we took the chance, was that we thought we could get the samples we needed. Remember, the problem was that we were measuring people who were sick. And although I'd written about it a lot over the years, I've advocated it, no one seemed in the research establishment seemed interested in collecting samples from people who were well. And we, seeing that we had this possible analysis, having our mass spectrometer, I uh, wrote a review article, which Noah and I wrote, which is in your packet, 
And uh, uh, a very generous donor said, how much will it take to build a minimal sample bank? And gave us the money to buy the freezers and the vials and so forth. And so we started to build a sample bank. And our idea was that we would work with physicians. We bought little minus 80 degree freezers for the physician and a little bigger military grade to store the samples in because we worked with physicians in the 70s. But the lawyers have been busy. And we learned when we started to talk with the physicians that now it is possible for the lawyers to sue any physician who stores a sample if it can be set shown that any analysis done on that sample and now in the future while it's being stored might have benefited the person who gave the sample. So if a physician asks his people, which is what we expected, we'll work with a physician, he'll get 500 of his, you know, his clients to participate, then we don't need you know, 20 or 30 physicians, we have a good sample bank. Um, the, uh, it was impossible because if one of our physicians was sued because he had kept a sample, he had been involved in keeping a sample for someone, and the lawyer could show that somewhere in the world there was an analysis that could have been performed on the sample that would help the person, he'd have a legal liability. So we had to do it a different way. And, you know, molecular clocks were okay when you get into urine and all this stuff. Maybe the staff, I don't know whether the staff got a little surly or not, but they got a project where they wanted to send me off 3,000 miles away to Washington and get rid of me. And so we were running for, for Congress. I'm just joking. They worked very hard. He's the campaign manager. But uh, uh, so we became uh, the first congressional campaign in American history to ask the voters for a urine sample. <laughs> and we, we, I, I put in your packet the little flyer we sent out. We sent it to 500,000 voters in District 4, a little out of District 4, but uh, Southern Oregon. 8,500 said they wanted to do it, 5,000 actually followed through, and today our sample bank collects periodic samples on 5,000 people. And the idea, unfortunately, is to wait until those samples become interesting, and they become interesting because of the misfortune of those participating. You have to write into the document, as you'll see very clearly, we are not physicians, we will give you no information, we will not help you in any way. Uh, if we were to help someone because we saw something in their urine, they could get us for using an unapproved advice and practicing medicine without a license. And I don't really want to go to jail, and neither does he. So we write very carefully, you're just doing this for humanity, you're just doing it for research, you'll receive no help, all this. It's all in that flyer, and we got the volunteers. Interestingly, uh, there was a strong age selection in the people who volunteered and followed through. I think partially because uh, older people are more concerned about health and they volunteer. In any case, we sent it linearly to the whole age distribution, but those are the age distributions in our sample bank. 5,000 people periodically giving us urine samples. We're storing them at minus 80 degrees centigrade so they can't change. And, uh, and, and that bank, you see, if you, someone gets cancer and you have the sample before they knew they had cancer, now you have eliminated the problem of working on sick people. Uh, the linear distribution of diseases uh, in, uh, in, by, the, by the CDC uh, actuarial statistics are one third they are for ours because ours being older gets sick sooner. So our 5,000 are the equivalent of 15,000 ordinary Americans in all ages. And uh, this, uh, we've, we've not, and we want to, we wanted a sample every six months We've really been getting about once a year. It's all volunteer. The whole lab has to shut down for a couple of months to send out the boxes and get them back. You have to send boxes with urine kits to 5,000 people. It takes time. Then they have to reply and so forth. So we're getting these samples, but not as frequently as we like, but we intend to improve it. And it's the only bank of its kind, as far as I know, in the world. And so we, in, in two, two visits, one where we went to Bill Rock in Massachusetts, this company sells about one of these, they say they sell one of these machines in the world every month. I think it's not quite as frequent as that. But they, and they're the only company that makes them, but they have one and we were allowed to use it. The first three weeks, uh, Noah uh, measured things. Well, there is the sex profile in that thing with a huge number of substances measured and could be done in a couple of minutes. He took seven and you see there are almost 3,000. You see how many? See, it would be a straight line if there were no pattern. 
So you can see how far the blue line lies above the straight line. We've got about 3,000 peaks. And when you divide by the fact that uh, they have uh, maybe eight-fold redundancy when you combine them, you have uh, three or 400 substances that are correlating with sex. And you can see what sorts of sex is. Then if you did the uh, aging pattern, the same thing. It's what we've gotten 40 years ago. We've got it again. And interestingly, these machines can tell you what the substance is uh, because they know the exact molecular weight. You can be off a little bit because not the molecular weight is not totally unique, but for the most part, they tell you. So in the old days with the chromatographs 40 years earlier, we couldn't tell what most of them were, but we could tell what some of them were. And we had 20, but we knew how much, what they were chemically, and we knew whether they went up or down with age. And you know, he measured them with this, and sure enough, they're going up and down with age. 16 of them did exactly what they did before, and the four that didn't were very small peaks that had a lot of uncertainty. So the pattern we were looking at, chemically, is the same pattern that we discovered 40 years earlier, except it's much more powerful because so many things are there. These are, and I'll, I'll, to, I'll illustrate, I talked about this a minute earlier, but I'll talk a little more about it now to make sure you understand. Uh, We've taken, in this case, he's taken one group of aged men and determined the age pattern by looking at separating above and below the age of 50 and then finding the pattern. That's what you saw on the previous one. Uh, and then determined a diagnostic coefficient, which is a, a pattern recognition technique of taking, them all, uh, taking the substances and compressing them into a single uh, number. Uh, it's not quite that. We take the logarithm of the ratios, which is more uh, in line with chemistry, but in any case, it's that process. He's used about 500 parameters and uh, determined the aging profile in one group, and then an entirely different group of men classified the men to see how you could do. So and if you classify them, you, each one gets a number, and those numbers are in order, and they extend from old to young, and each person is on that axis. And of course, if they were stuffed at the ends of the axis with no overlap, that would be perfect. But that's not what you get. Uh, and then you graph the number of inc uh, incorrectly classified young. If you are willing to incor incor incorrectly classify this many, you can get all the old correct. You get the idea? Or if you're willing to make uh, uh, four mistakes, uh, then uh, uh, if you're willing to get six incorrect, you, you'll make three mistakes on the old, you get the idea. If this is a disease, and the reason we designed, the, invented these diagrams is that a profiling experiment does not contain the information about how it will be used. So if it's a dread disease, you're willing to scare some well people to get all the sick ones right. And if it's a mild thing, you don't want to make as many errors. But from this, a person, and in this case, it's aging, but we only know the chronological ages and we're measuring the physiological age. That weakens it, so it can't be a point in the origin. It also is weakened because their physiological age overlap. We divide them at the age of 50, but some of those 48-year-olds are gonna outlive some of the 52-year-olds and so forth. So in aging, this is not gonna become perfect, but you see the, the idea. Uh, but then, uh, not long before we went, uh, not quite as long as it should have been, uh, we sent letters to our 5,000 people and said, the last time we got a urine sample from you was such and such a date. Has there been any unusual change in your health since you gave the sample? And, uh, and this is the first time in Bilirica, and we had 14 people who had gotten, been diagnosed with prostate cancer since they gave a sample. We had seven who had been diagnosed with breast cancer since they gave a sample. And we had 11 who had a, had a I have to use cardiac events to satisfy Jane. The heart attacks, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, 11 people who, they're not quite clean, six of them had had no health problems and had a sudden heart attack after they gave the sample. And five of them had had heart problems before and then had another heart attack after they gave the sample. But the results are remarkable. Now we're looking at things that happened to people after they gave us samples, and the samples stored at minus 80. So we're looking at them as they are. And 
it was astonishing. You see, there's a tremendously strong pattern for cardiac events, for heart attacks. Uh, pattern for breast cancer is weaker, but we only had seven people to find it. And for prostate cancer, it's uh, weak, but it's there. Prostate cancer is kind of an interesting thing. I uh, was talking to uh, a physician at the Mayo Clinic, and today they ask every, patient, every male patient to sign a piece of paper saying they, they are ordered never to do another PSA test on it because they have found at the Mayo Clinic that if they get all these, false, all these positives and they do more harm than good. So uh, they don't even want to do the tests now. But anyway, the prostate cancer pattern. We went back again. They gave us four days several months later, went back again. By that time, we had 10 more people who had had heart attacks without warning and no previous problems. So uh, this was the first, and here we're separating them and, and graphing it so you can see it. The diagnostic coefficient is there. The separation point is the green line. So in the first experiment, you can see there's an accumulation of controls on one side and, and car heart attacks on the other. You can see the line dividing them. We did the experiment again, this time on 16 who had had no heart attack, uh, no heart problems before they had their heart attack. And again, uh, you can see the separation is pretty good. Uh, we did the same thing with breast cancer, and uh, we had one. They're, they appear to be paired because they are. In order to do the control right, you put, get someone of the same age and sex, and you compare him to the other one with that age and sex, and then they are pulled apart by the coefficients. So for every, so they're symmetrical. But uh, the patterns we, we now reproduce the, the, the prostate can, the, the uh, cardiac cancer experiment, and these are the experiments I showed you before. They're def and you can then take this and simply use non-parametric statistics to calculate the probability that these separations occur by chance. And I think they're 94 for the 94 percent, uh, 94 percent good for the breast cancer, and uh, 97 for the prostate cancer, and the cardiac things are 99.9 percent that there is a thing. Uh, then you can do the uh, the diagnostic power graph. This is done on the 21 people who had heart attacks versus the controls, and you can see if you pick if you were to decide to pick it here. Uh, you could warn 19 of the 21 they were going to have a heart attack and only scare two that weren't. It's probably even better than that because the probability of heart attacks in these people, 25% of our controls will die of heart attacks eventually. So our controls are not perfect and it's probably a little better even than that. Uh, that's remarkable because it's useful to be warned. Nine of these 21 people died in the heart attack that they had. And had they known, and had warning. Maybe they'd have seen their doctor. Maybe they'd have bought a defibrillator and had it in their home so their wife could jump on them, or husband, and jump on them and uh, revive them before they go to the hospital. Uh, people drop dead of heart attacks 30 or 40 percent of the time. They are killed by the heart attack before they ever get treatment. If you can warn them, it's important. Which uh, leads to an interesting problem. So this illustrates, I think I'm just saying what we discovered there. Uh, the 82% probability, 82 the cardiac uh, diagnostic coefficient, we look at the red line and we see what, how far we've gone toward the origins, 82% of the way. Uh, this is a, just repeating what I just told you, but when he'd gone the first time, our emphasis was on aging. We, we hadn't done those uh, things very much, and, and so he measured 200 people who were in good health or thought to be in good health. There are reports that they gave with the samples so they were in good health, 200, 100 men, 100 women. And a power of this technique is that one measurement does everything, all the things you want to know about your health, whether you're monitoring your, your therapy or you're looking to see if you're sick or you're looking at the probability that, that you'll live a long time. All the patterns, I'm sure, we know enough now from all the things we've done that there will be a pattern for virtually everything that afflicts human beings that uh, they would like to know about. So you're just doing one thing. Well, these 200 people were measured for an entirely different reason. We were gonna look at the age profile and we had a lot of them, different ages. But since they were there, Noah, of course, did the calculation 
to see about their heart attacks. And uh, this is the division. This is what comes out when he does the calculation. 28% of them uh, are shown to be heart attack prone. And the CDC statistics say that 27% of the people in this age group will die of heart attacks, which raises an interesting ethical problem because we know that about these people and we'll go to jail if we tell them. What do we do? <laughs> uh, this was just done a couple months ago. Uh, so of these people, 28% have a coefficient that puts them in that group and we were at least 90% reliable in putting them in, putting the, the experimental ones in a group, and of these, 27%. So should we warn these people? Well, the administrative state says, we within the government medical industrial complex prohibit you from warning these 56 people. You have no permits. What would our president's chief advisor say? Steve Bannon would say, it is our goal to annihilate the administrative state. And as, I, as my all-time favorite political quotation, what we have done is con con uh, consulted some lawyers. <laughs> I'm going to try to get a judge to say we can tell them. Because they're going to die. And they're probably going to die while they're in our bank. And I'm not interested in seeing the deaths come in and know that I knew something to help them and didn't. What's happening in this, it's, a, it's a different, it's conceptually different. What we're doing is populist medicine. You know what the movement populism is doing in our country. We just elected a populist president. We are trying to, I'm, I'm going to give you a political speech. Believe me, I can keep you here all night. I've given a lot of them. It's kind of interesting. You know, he won't give this talk because he's like, uh, I've, I've been very fortunate in life to work with a few very, very outstanding scientists. And except for one, most of them are shy, and they have a tremendous amount of humility. And they are just quiet, shy people. The greatest scientists I've known, except for Pauling, and he'd been in the political arena enough that he was a little different, but uh, they're, they're shy, reserved, quiet. And if they really are super scientists, the thing they know the best is what they don't know. If you look at the quotes of Einstein and Newton, People like this, these quotes show incredible humility. I, I can't remember an Einstein one in full, but Newton said near the end of his life, I don't know what I've appeared to the world. And you know, Isaac Newton caused the Industrial Revolution. I mean, it, when he had done mechanics, physics at that level was finished. And he said, I don't know what I appear to the world, but to myself, I'm just like a small boy playing on the seashore and every now and then seeing a more beautiful pebble or shell while the old, whole ocean of truth goes undiscovered before me. That was the greatest scientist who's ever lived. Einstein was the same. Most of the great scientists I've known are the same. I've been very fortunate to work with this man because he's 10 times the scientist I ever was, and he's the same, shy, humility, and he wouldn't get up and give this talk. He did this work. The, uh, but, Consider, consider what you're doing here. This is populist medicine. Uh, I'm not against physicians. There will always be a line outside their door. Uh, we need them for therapeutic work. We need their experience and so forth. But you know it's a profession that evaluates its own work. You have to go to the gatekeeper to find out how you're doing or even what's wrong with you. In populist medicine, you want to square that curve. You have to be able to help everybody. You have to, I don't care how much money, is a poor person has to be able to get the same thing. Well, uh, and that's populist medicine. In 200 years, it will be gone because the biochemists will have completed their work and they will understand. Today, they don't understand. So this is empirical work. Uh, so we don't want them to have to wait in line, sicken, and wait for a gatekeeper. But think about this. Today, this, the way this sample that was done was a little drop of urine, five microliters of urine, if you can imagine something that small, it's a tiny, tiny drop, was put on a source and hit with a laser, vaporized it, ionized it, it went through this machine and it measured 200,000 peaks and did these things. And we have now, we've got patterns developing on other diseases. We've got quite a few people from Alzheimer's, quite a few people with strokes. I know we're gonna find patterns. These patterns are unique for each one. 
But a person would be able to get one of these little targets, maybe a special piece of paper, and uh, mail it in with a 48 cent stamp. And a few days later, his profile comes up on the internet. Uh, the people who did the analysis could analyze it, or he could just take his profile and give it to the statistical medical provider of his choice. And all these guys on the internet could be competing, telling you how good they were at analyzing. They should, do, should do the same thing with MRIs. You should get an MRI for 50 bucks, put your MRI on the internet, and have internet companies competing for the interpretation. Uh, we're at the point, because of the microprocessor revolution and the internet, and the development of technology, where people should be able to find out not just why they feel bad, but find out about things that will make them feel bad and have quantitative information to adjust that so they don't get in that position to try to square that curve. And uh, this uh, shows it's possible. This hasn't been done before, but it shows it's possible. Moreover, it's probable. I don't think it can be stopped. Uh, I don't know who will provide the first commercial thing, but they submit the data. And uh, I think, like, we didn't do this work. Laura Lee and I worked for 10 years on this before she died, or a long time, maybe a little longer than that. But uh, she died of pancreatitis. Uh, she was, got a bad stomach ache, and she went to a medical doctor, and he said, uh, sent her home with a laxative. Uh, you probably got a digestive problem. And a month later, she went to the doctor again, got the same advice. I had the laxatives on the shelf for about 10 years. And then one night, she got a real pain. And I said, you want me to take you in? She says, now let's see how I feel in the morning. And the morning never comes. She died that night. Her pancreas released digestive enzymes onto a nearby artery, and she bled to death. There is a test in the clinical laboratory at the hospital that definitively determines that disease, and a surgeon can save your life. But this is a sick lady in the middle of the night, an hour and a half from the hospital, thinking it's $1,000 at the emergency room. I'll probably have to spend it if I don't feel good in the morning, but I can wait till morning. And for her, normally never came. And during the last 10 years, 20 years, how many millions of people have died in this way, not knowing what was the degenerative disease that was growing among them, having no quantitative information to fight it, and uh, not having access, in her case, the first guy should have sent it to the clinical lab. But he didn't, because 43-year-olds don't get pancreatitis. So uh, what we have today in the medical model, there's a big line outside the doctor's door. These are people who are suffering, feeling badly, so they go there. Money is spent on them, the doctor does his best. But analytically, the technology is 50 years behind. There's a couple hundred things that can be measured in the clinical lab if he gets excited and wants to learn more. They measure about 40, 50, 30 things in their blood. They've been measuring the same ones for 50 or 60 years. And really, most physicians don't even pay attention to those. So uh, now, with these kinds of machines and with sample banks to calibrate them, it uh, may become possible to do this kind of thing. And I've, it's been 49 years since I had the idea one night to try this, and I'm delighted that he gave me the chance to see it. And I'm pleased to share it with you. That's all we've done. We hope that we'll get a chance to go back there and spend three or four days in Massachusetts again a few months from now. And, Maybe, and perhaps have a couple more diseases to brag about. This is going to be published in two weeks in the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons journal that, that uh, Jane runs. And uh, we chose that journal. It's a good journal. It puts a lot of things out. It doesn't usually publish basic science, but uh, although I've published quite a few papers in clinical chemistry and standard journals in the old days, uh, this is disruptive technology, and I thought it was best not to, uh, to, not to try this. <laughs> okay. So if anybody has questions, I've tried to make it listen. What? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I noticed, I don't know whether you'll be like this, because I haven't described this to anyone. We kept it kind of secret, and there were only about half a dozen people know about the paper until I gave this talk. But each of the ones I told about it wanted to give a urine sample. <laughs> so... Uh, there, there are kits out there, and if you're not already in the group, the first aging experiment, I think some of you were actually in it, the one he did on our old mass spectrometer, because we've, been, we've got some samples from Access to Energy subscribers and people that have run into us over the years. So are there any qu questions, if I left anything in doubt? Is this on the labor? I mean, is that 
not worth the paper to do it. Oh, I don't know. I know that the, uh, the legal situation is clear, but I believe that the ethical situation is also clear, and I think we will be able to find a legal way to, to tell these people. But there are all kinds of complications. What about the ones that don't have a heart attack? And we scare them. Right. And it's complicated, but I believe we'll get permission. We're, we just, this is very new. We're publishing it for the first time. We didn't even have these patterns a month ago. So uh, we're looking into that. Uh, it shouldn't be this way. Uh, there, there, it's just another aspect of freedom that has been taken away from the physicians. A physician uh, usually is an idealistic young person that wants to help people, and he goes to medical school. He knows if he works hard and, and gets a good education, he'll be affluent, it'll be a good life, but most physicians start out wanting to help people. Once they get their license, they discover that the medical, industrial, governmental complex says, it's okay for you to help people if you do it just our way, and if you deviate, you won't have a license. That interferes with a lot of things. Physicians should be able to experiment on their patients to the best of their ability. They shouldn't face a legal behemoth and a government that controls them. But in the process of controlling the American people, they've controlled our physicians. And this has greatly impeded medical research and medical work. And of course, raised the price hugely. You get about the same, except for the imaging machines, you get pretty much the same medicine you got 50 years ago. Uh, at three times the real price, even after taking inflation out. But that's, that's like the schools, you know. Uh, uh, the average school in the United States, uh, the taxpayer pays $12,000 per student. That's $360,000 per 30-student classroom. About a third of it goes to pay the teacher in the classroom. The other two-thirds goes to the, to the administrative state. <laughs> right? why, why and the same thing is true of medicine. And that also is a tremendous loss. And uh, to repeat in a different way something I said before, the homeschoolers stuck their hands up. You listen to all these things about our nation, you know, about all these problems, all these things. Most of us are older. I want to thank like you for everything you've rally. added to my life. Do you know what thank the you. average age of a male donor to a political party is in the United States? 70. 70. We're all older, we see these problems, but our only hope is in our youth. And if I were all of you thinking about all the things that have been happening today, and all the things you've been listening today, these homeschooling, I think they're all girls, all these homeschooling girls that stuck up their hands, go gather around and talk to them for a while and look at them. That's the main reason you may succeed. Uh, I, oh, I'm sorry. I, um, made my living in the clinical laboratory as a pathologist, mm -hmm. and I was in charge of the clinical chemistry, the, the SMAC machine that does 20 tests. And there were private labs, one in New York, I think it was called MetPath, yeah. that used a machine called the Grinder that I think did 36 assays. Yeah. And Medicare came in and the government and said, you can't do that many tests. Yeah. You can only do 12. <laughs> and yeah. so it, it, yeah. uh, it, once you get yeah. past all your other barriers, and you can do 200 tests, they're going to yeah. tell you maybe you can only do 12. Well, there's a tremendous <laughs> barrier. I'll illustrate, when we were started this work 40 years ago, I was talking to a vice president of 3M Corporation. And 3M had huge clinical labs. They were running tests, you know, these 30-person, 30 30-substance 30 tests. And I said, you know, we're measuring the best we can. We're working on this research. But you're getting 30 parameters from hundreds of thousands of people. Get a few statisticians and start telling the, the doctor the, what the profile is. That he can't calculate 30 things and get a profile in his head. So why don't you just get a statistician and drag what you can out of 30 parameters? You know what he said? He said, why should we do that? We're making good money making, doing what we're doing. But moreover, he wasn't necessarily saying everything. In order to do that, he would have to have government permission. It's probably hundreds of millions of dollars to get to do that to get permission. Now, I don't feel too sorry for them because the pharmaceutical companies and the measuring companies and the, the bureaucrats, it's like the revolving doors in the banks. So they're all in it. But uh, it takes enormous amounts of money to ch make change anything. Everybody has to get a piece of it before something can filter down that you're allowed to do. Here, you want to build a nuclear power plant, it's the same way. These guys mentioned nuclear power. Uh, 
Today, if there's a running nuclear power plant, all proved, everything running, it's great. GE built one, you're going to build another one. If it's built in Taiwan, it costs $2.2 billion. If it's built in the United States, it'll cost seven or eight billion. And it must go through a 10-year approval process, even though there's a running plant that they previously approved. Uh, that's the administrative state has destroyed nuclear power. And it has tremendously slowed medicine, and it's all around us. We just lost our last lumber mill, and the guy that owned the mill and ran it for 30 years started telling me his troubles, and it, I could have just taken a recording and put it in access to energy. It's the same. Everybody in this country that tries to does do something productive hits this thing. I call them the foot soldiers of the elite. There are three million of them. They're earned, they are paid twice as high for their work as the average person in private industry, and their job <laughs> is to enslave you. And they do a pretty good job. So this is disruptive, and we don't have any of them down our backs yet. But once, a long time ago, about 10 years ago, we, we always wondered whether we could get the money to do this research commercially. And George Gilder called me up and he says, I got a couple guys I want you to meet. So I went out to Massachusetts. George had two hot shot, top of the line uh, venture capital guys who gonna give me advice about whether you could do this research. Because this is all, I don't think anybody in our labs has paid anything for doing this work. We've just done it. And uh, he said, uh, and I got there and these two guys listened and they said, well, suppose your machine can do what you think it can and you're onto something and you're right. He says, what we advise you to do is start a company and give the majority of the stock to a huge HMO or some giant medical organization. Because if you're right, they're gonna sue you into the ground. Your competitors will never let you reach the marketplace. You have to have a big brother. In other words, only out of that system. But today it's changing and I think the internet, I don't think it'll be that way. I think people will pick this up and do it. And I hope that company, even though they they haven't priced a machine we can afford. I hope that they'll sell 100 to people who will do this. We do it, change things. Thank you. Is that okay? Well, periodically. There's a uh, already addressed stamped uh, box. Uh, there's a little cup which helps collect the sample. There's a little simple medical form. And uh, Inside here, and, and inside here are two cryogenic vials. And you fill those about two thirds full, each one of them, and you put it back in here, and you drop it in that box, and you drop it in the mail, and we'll have it. And, uh, the, uh, <laughs> and you'll be in cold storage. Because it's okay for me to ask you for a urine sample and you to give it to me with no, no promises made. If I were a physician, I wouldn't dare because there would be an implied medical authority involved. If we've already sent you a, a sample. Send another one. We, all, we, we, we wanted to get, yeah, well, send us another one. And uh, Matthew will open them and you go in the freezer and you're anonymous. And notice how small the vials are. The machines are getting more and more sensitive. That was done on five microliters of urine. Each of these vials hold 1,500 microliters. And, uh, and we have two because you could store them in two places. So.